first, I just want to say thanks to everyone who came. Uh, thanks to my friends and family who made the long trips to get here and watch me speak. Uh, thank you. So I'll be speaking on abusing AWS permissions and ultimately teaching an old dog new tricks. Let's get on to the new next slide and you'll see what I'm talking about. So firstly, who am I? Or if you're an AWS nerd like me, AWS SDS get caller identity. My name is Jason. I work at Jumo as a cybersecurity engineer and I've been in the industry for half a decade, which is roughly five years. Um, which are basically dog years in the cybersecurity industry. Things move at such a fast pace. And I left my email address there in case you want to contact me. Um, I just put that there because emails for companies are really easy to enumerate and you guys are going to figure it out anyways. So if you need to get hold of me, it's over there. Quick agenda. What we're going to do is we're going to cover some basic access principles within AWS. I want everyone to be up to speed with what everything means before we jump into something a little bit more fun. Um, if you've ever seen any talk that I've ever done before, you know that there's going to be a live demo component. I really hope that the demo gods are with me for this one. Uh, we're going to cover two main policy types, resource-based policies and identity-based policies. Cool. So first things first, this is the flow diagram that displays whether an action can be executed on a resource or not. This is displayed by, this is given by AWS, the source is at the bottom, and we're just going to cover this very highly. So first we look at what AWS does is they look at all of your policies for any explicit denied um, policies or statements. And if there is, then it'll deny the action. Other than that, we started SCPs, service control policies, uh, which are organization wide. Basically, you can have multiple AWS accounts in one organization and apply policies at an account level. The next part I think everyone is a little bit familiar with are resource based policies and identity based policies. These are things that we're going to focus on. I just want to mention that the difference between an explicit deny and an implicit deny. An explicit deny means that you state that this resource cannot perform this action, where an implicit deny means that there's no allow permissions. So it's denied by default. As I said, these are the two we're going to focus on because I think most companies focus on these two. So at a high level, what is a policy? A policy is a document that contains a number of statements that determine whether or not an action can be performed on a resource. A statement generally has an effect, action, and a resource, as well as sometimes a condition. So the effect can be either allow or deny, the action could be what's going to be performed, and the resource is whatever resource you want. You can also add wildcards to this, which is a stop. So we're looking at resource-based policies. Essentially, if we go back to this document, you can see that resource-based policies, the logic is looked at first before identity-based policies. So what I mean by this gate over here, we'll get to that. Firstly, resource-based policies can allow principals outside of the current account to interact with that resource. And a lot of companies focus their efforts on ensuring that their identity-based policies are as strict as possible. But if your resource-based policy, if someone creates a resource-based policy that allows an action and there is no identity-based policy that explicitly denies the action, so there's implicit denies, well then all the safeguards you've put in place around identity-based policies are essentially as good as this gate. It's really short and someone can easily just jump over it. And there's also some permission, permissive options available directly from the console. So if you're in the AWS console, um, there might be some very permissive uh, actions that can take place. What I mean by this is we've seen buckets go through many iterations of improvements. So we're not really going to focus on buckets. I decided that we would look at a different resource. The simple notification service, SNS. I'm definitely going to undersell the service. It's a really cool service. But essentially what it allows you to do is send, send 
emails and SMSs and other notification types to different services as well as users. And when you're creating an SNS topic from the console, this is the access policy options that you are given from the console. And what I find quite interesting is that you, given with the basic options, you're given some very limited um, options to choose from, only the topic owner, everyone, and only the specified AWS accounts. So if we look at the first one, right, only the topic owner, what exactly does that mean, right? And the only way to really see what that means is to look at the policy on the right. As you can see from this policy, it has a whole bunch of permissions, publish, remove permissions, set topic attributes, and so on, and on the resource, and then it has a condition. So any resource within this account can perform those actions by default. And this is the default one that's checked. So essentially, this policy is permissive by default. If you created this resource-based policy, regardless of what permissions you have given uh, other, use, other IAM entities, such as users or roles, if there are no explicit denies, then they would be able to perform those actions by default. Now, what I found more interesting is the one that says everyone. And the little description says anybody can publish. So what does that actually mean? What is anybody in AWS? So if we look at the policy on the right here, it says principal AWS star. That means that's a wild card for anything. That means any AWS account, anyone who has any object within an AWS account that they control or IAM entity could perform that publish attribute if you click the, the, the anybody. So essentially what you're doing by clicking that everyone is allowing anyone in the world to publish to your topic. And if you click the everyone for the subscribe action, then you can subscribe anything you want to that topic. Anyone in the world could do that. Let's have a quick look at identity-based policies. These are policies that are attached to users, groups, and roles. Users are intended to be real live users, so human people. Uh, groups are just a grouping of users and roles. And roles are essentially the services or users that can inherit those permissions. You can attach multiple documents to any of these. And some actions that are given to an entity can allow that entity to gain more permissions or give someone else more permissions, either in conjunction with other actions or just by themselves. And we'll have a look into this. Here's just a quick video. Just a demo on what we've just spoken about. I'm going to show you that I've created a user named Jason, which is me. The user has no groups, so no inherited permissions. If we open this user, we see that they actually have no permissions. They've been given absolutely no permissions. So because they've been given no permissions, it's implicit deny for everything. So let's look at the SNS topic. If we look at the topic, I created this topic using the default, basically just giving it a name and clicking next, 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 next. Um, if we look at the policy document or the, the access policy, we can see that it's as we stated, any AWS account can interact with this and perform any of these actions as long as that IAM entity comes from that account, which it does, right? So it just doesn't have any permissions given to it. So now we can just see here that we have two pending subscriptions and I'm logged in as that user and I'm going to create an additional, um, we saw that there was only one user, I'm going to create an additional subscription. And we run it because, just give a second, if we go back, see testing three, which is the one we just created, if we go back and just refresh, we can see that testing three was created. And that's because if we look at this, doc, this flow chart here, we can see that resource-based policies are evaluated before identity-based policies. Essentially meaning that the permissions given to that user, unless they fall in this category, sorry, unless they fall in this category explicit deny, um, don't actually matter. And that's what I meant by this gate. If you focus all your effort on identity-based policies, it's not very effective against resources that have resource-based policies. <laughs> cool. 
So now how can we apply old techniques or old mindsets to these new cloud problems? So we've all heard of Bloodhound. I think there's no one in this room who hasn't heard of Bloodhound, um, which allows you to see different, how things can interact with each other, different resources. There's a similar tool for AWS that was written by Craig, which is very cool. And it allows very similar things. But because of how many permissions and how many different resources there are and resources are added literally all the time, we need to apply our hacking mindsets when looking at stuff like this. So I'm going to show you, the demo that I'm going to show you is a path that these tools actually did not pick up. And now we're going to jump into the fun stuff. So what I've done is I thought I'll take the Capital One hack as an entry point, everyone. I think it's familiar with that. We've been testing a web app and we see that the web app makes a call to this web service and it sends in that parameter. So what we do is we change that URL parameter to google.com or any other website and we realize that it returns that data to us. So if you're familiar with web application security, you'll know that this is server side request forgery, SSRF, and we can essentially have the networking capability of the server. We can make the server perform HTTP requests on our behalf. Cool. So the first thing I would do is first understand, is that an EC2 instance? Perform an NS lookup to see if there's a DNS name attached to it, and we see that it is an EC2 instance. So if you're in the AWS environment or, or you're very familiar with AWS topics, your spidey senses will be absolutely tingling at this point, thinking, is there a role attached to this instance? Because uh, you have SSRF, you have the ability to query the metadata service, and you might be able to give credentials. So let's jump into a little bit of a demo. First things first, I'm just going to run my SSRF vulnerable web app. And to save time, I've run, so I'll copy paste the commands. And essentially the metadata service allows us to query information about the EC2 instance. And at a fundamental level, we are allowed to actually obtain the AWS credentials for that role. So it works the same as a user account, right? It has an access key and a, part and a secret key. So if we run this, Basically what I'm doing here is I'm querying the meta service to find out if there is a role attached. And it came back with, yes, there's a role attached. Oh, sorry about that. So I queried the metadata service to find out if there's any IAM security credentials attached to this or a role, and there is a role. It's called EC2 Lambda role. So now what we can do is actually obtain the credentials for that role by just using the same endpoint, the AWS Metadata Service endpoint. And now we see that we have the access key and the secret and the secret key as well as a token. So if we do an AWS, so what I'm doing is configuring my local AWS instance, just give it a, my local AWS uh, CLI. Uh, as with live demos, looks like it's already broken. Just give it a second. Okay, cool. Well, let's just start again. Just looks like it's taking a bit of time. Internet's slow. Cool idea why I copied that. I see it didn't copy the session token, which is fine. Let's do it manually. Bash my use of nano. So 
this is the file where your credentials are stored when you configure the AWS service. The session token is definitely not correct. I'll kill the whole line, but I can't remember what the variable name is. But essentially what I want to show you is that it's not, you're not required. No. Let's do it this way. Yeah, but anyways, what I'm trying to get to with this is that we can see that where the over here, EC2 Lambda role on this instance ID. What I'm trying to get with this is those credentials don't have to be used on the specific EC2 instance that the role is attached to. You can actually use those credentials wherever you want. They work just like normal access tokens. Cool, now you have compromised AWS credentials. Now what? What are you gonna do with them, right? If you're doing a pen test, your goal is to find all avenues of attack, right? But if you're doing something nefarious or a red team, what, what is your goal? And generally, the DA equivalent is all actions over all resources, which essentially allows you to perform whatever you want on whatever you want, assuming that there are no SCPs in place or resource-based policies stopping you from doing what you want to do. Cool. So the first thing we're going to run here is we're going to use our newly found credentials to find out if we have, what, what policies we have attached to them. First, we're just going to use the CLI. And we have three policies, and already I can see one that is awesome. If we look at these policies over here, it would have the AWS account ID if it was created within that account. If it says AWS, there's a managed policy, which essentially means AWS managed that policy, and it's available to any account. So you can use your own account to see what permissions you have without doing anything weird. Um, and if we look at one of the interesting policies, AWS Lambda full access. This is also an AWS managed policy. Just gonna have a quick look at it and look at the permissions. So the assumption there is really that you'll have all permissions over Lambda but we're not 100% sure, it's a role. Let's do it this way. So what's interesting here is if you look at the uh, description, it says grants full access to AWS Lambda servers, AWS Lambda console features, and other related services. We're not gonna look at all of the statements. We can already see that we can do anything on Lambda, which essentially means we can create a Lambda that we want, execute whatever code we, we want. If you're not familiar with Lambda, essentially it's something that allows you to run code without thinking of the underlying infrastructure. And this is the statement that's also quite interesting. So what we can do is we're allowed to pass a role, essentially attach a role to an AWS instance, um, to a, sorry, an AWS Lambda function. What's quite cool about that is if there is an existing role with different permissions to what we already have, we automatically gain those permissions because we can execute code with that. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So just to show you that we're still that user, even in this console, in this terminal. Cool. We are, and I'm going to create a Lambda function and I'm going to pass 
a role that we previously found. Let me actually go through that. That one is not too obvious. I think I skipped over that. If we look at the roles, if we list all the roles in the account, essentially what we're looking for is one that allows the principal, so the service, to be lambda.amazon.aws, which corresponds with the policy that we had. So we can only pass policies for that service. Um, I'm just going to go pretty fast because I know it's towards the end. But essentially, we'd look at these pretty closely. We see this vault role. What I see that is quite interesting is SSM Lambda Manager. SSM stands out to me because that's the service manager within AWS, which is essentially something that allows you to control all EC2 instances that are in the SSM fleet. So you can run code, push software, control those EC2 instances. So that's quite an interesting one to me. And if we look at the permissions attached to that policy, to, to, sorry, to that role, we can see another AWS managed policy. And I know this policy pretty well. Essentially what it is, is it allows all permissions to be performed, um, all SSM actions which it will allow us to push code to instances in the fleet, allow us to view the fleet, allow us to view instances within that fleet. So let's have a look at that, just so I can give you an idea of what SSM is. So we have two instances within this fleet. We have the web server, that's the, if we looked at the account ID versus the, uh, if we went back up, we would see versus the, the role that is assumed that has that at the end, um, we would see that we compromise the web server. We also see this admin host, which is quite interesting. So what I would do is I'd go look at EC2 and see exactly what this admin host is, because essentially we have full control over that admin host. Way to look at it. If we see the admin host actually has a role attached to it, and this role is an EC2 admin. So now what we want to do is we want to create a Lambda function that allows us to compromise this EC2 admin account. Because that EC2 admin account has all actions over all over everything. So our initial entry point through SSRF allowed us to compromise a web server, which had a role attached to it, that could create an AWS Lambda function, which would, had the ability to pass a role to any function that we created. And that role allows for full control over the systems manager, which allows us to run a command on an EC2 instance that has a role with all actions over all resources. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but I think you guys have the general picture. So now what we're gonna do is actually create this Lambda function. And I'm gonna focus on the console because I think it's a, a much better visual representation than kind of just looking at lines of code on a screen. So we looked at how EC2 instances obtain their credentials using the metadata service. Let's have a look at how Lambda functions do it. So Lambda functions do it in a bit of a different way. They do it by using environment variables. So the first line of code we have there is just to print out the environment variables. Let's give a refresh. So if we look at the environment variables, just like with the metadata service, we can see that there's the session token. And if you look through the rest, you'll find all the rest of the credentials. So that's how it works. It's not exclusive to the Lambda function. It can be used pretty much anywhere, just like EC2. 
Now what we're going to do is actually add to this Lambda function the ability to run a command on the EC2 instance. This command will query the metadata service on that instance and return the credentials for the role attached to it. So essentially, we have the ability to also view the SSM commands that have been run, the history, and find the output for that. And like all demos, it broke. Cool. This. I hope no one's taking note of the credentials. So let's look at the history. It definitely did not succeed. Cool. Again, did not succeed. Okay. Oh. Cool, we see that it did succeed. If we look at the output, we have the access key and the secret key, which essentially means we can use these credentials outside of AWS uh, in, our own, in our own local um, CLI and perform any action over any resource. We are the DA of the, the AWS environment. So I just want to go through something quickly. When I was performing this presentation to a couple of my mates, they asked me this question. And I actually kind of forgot. They said, yes, you can, this policy is here by default, uh, but someone needs to be able to guess the ARN to do that, right? Which is essentially your account number and the topic name. That's something we call security through obscurity. And to put, to give you a physical example, um, it's essentially if you had a house on a relatively busy street and you kept your keys in the pot outside, you told all your friends and family, but you relied on no one being able to figure it out. If that's good enough for you, sure, good luck, but that's definitely not good enough for, for most people who um, love security. Cool, so now we're, We've got all of the power. Well, not quite. There's only two gems there. It's only within this account. We have full admin over, over everything, essentially. So what could we do to actually stop this from happening? The three main things I could think of, really, is prevent, detect, and remediate. And we hear stuff like this a lot, these very high level prevent this, detect this, fix this, but actually how do we do that? And it really does depend on the organization, whether you're gonna put SCPs in place to stop certain, certain creation of resources, or only allow like a whitelist of, if your company only creates EC2 instances, instances, only allow that, don't allow attaching of roles, don't allow the creation of roles, whatever the case may be. Um, but the example, I work at a, a dev house, so if you do too, you'll be somewhat familiar with this if you use Jenkins. And what we do is we have two things really. One, we have custom modules. So we try and abstract the security away from the developers. The module, for instance, would be like for um, S3 buckets. If all S3 buckets are not allowed to be public, in the module, it won't even give you the option, right? You just create a bucket and in the background, it'll ensure that it's not public, it's encrypted, whatever other compliance policies you have. So we have a compliance step that also checks to ensure that that's in place in the pipeline. We want these things to fail at the PR stage because if it fails at the apply, we're gonna have an account with half created resources. Detect and remediate. So we don't know what we don't know, right? And we have a community that we can rely on. AWS has something called Security Hub, which tries to detect um, misconfigurations, not specific to what we spoke about today, but 
definitely other misconfigurations. That's a great tool to use. There are other open open source tools out there, such as Prowler and Scout Suite. Those are things you should definitely be making use of on a regular basis. And then remediate. Do you have a process to remediate these things? What, what is it? And what are the timelines? Are you sticking to those timelines? Do you have a security posture where you review these things? These are things that definitely need to be put in place. And yeah, just in conclusion, what I wanted to add to this is um, the tools are, are very good, but also we need to apply our hacking mindsets to some of these things. Like this path we found here was not a path that a tool found, but it's something that we could, we could see because we understand the technologies, right? We understand that an EC2 instance with an SSRF vulnerability would allow you to grab the, the role. We understand that being able to create a Lambda function and attach any policy that is, or any role that already exists would allow you to essentially abuse that role's permissions. So these are things that we need to think about when, 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 when doing assessments or creating these things. Cool, and that's it. Uh, scared to ask. I'm scared to ask this, but are there any questions? Yes, sir. Sure, that, that for SNS specifically or for other resources? Yeah, so essentially anyone with permissions to view the ARN would be able to find it. Um, so just to, to uh, jump onto what the question was, the question was those ARNs in the SNS topic, is that something that people would be able to find? Right, and just like the example with the physical security, where all your friends and family know where the key is, Everyone who has view only access or read only access or any permissions to view that within your account, which will probably be your entire dev team, would know what the ARN is. And if you're using that ARN in other systems that are not AWS related, they would be there too. So yeah, it's pretty dangerous to, to rely just on that. Also, the ARN is your account number and the topic name. So it, it's not something that's people may not be able to guess. It's, it's something people probably will be able to guess. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure, so the question there is, how do we maintain the compliance policies within our pipelines? Sure, so we have a security team that does that. Uh, we're constantly looking at new things. We also utilize other open source frameworks or research that's being published. So like Security Hub is a major driver for us. Um, yeah, so that's how we find that compliance. And again, those compliance steps fail at the PR stage, right? So that PR can't be merged. Um, so the developer will see that it's broken and why as soon as they try and push that code. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Correct. Yes. Okay, more of a statement than a question. So the metadata service, there's two versions. Version two actually stops this from happening. Version one is still the default. So if you create an EC2 instance through the, the console, AWS console, it'll create it with version one. And it'll be vulnerable to, if you have an SSRF vulnerability, you'd be able to call that. Justin. That's a very good question, I like it. 
when you when you say permission boundaries, are you talking about? Sorry, I've got to go back quite a few slides. I am permission boundaries over here. So look how far along the line that is. Right. That's after resource-based policies, and it's after identity-based policies. Sure. And what about resource-based policies and SCPs? So I think we try and focus as far to the left as possible. But, but yeah, that's not something that we've actually explored. Uh, it really does depend on the organization. As I said before, I think SCPs is a very good one if you have a lot of accounts and you want to enforce certain things on all of your accounts, but it really does depend on the organization. The question there was just the first one was, have we considered permission boundaries? And the second one was, are there any other guardrails that you've thought of putting in place? Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> the question is, is the, the tools within AWS, the, the, the permissions within AWS not good enough or not, not good enough is that, or that we need to use other tools? I don't think so. I think that AWS allows you to do whatever you want with whatever you want within the account. How you, you misconfiguring it is, is really on you. Um, but yeah, there are tools out there that help you identify these things and guardrails in place just to help you stay within those. Um, yeah, there, there are some really good, cool tools out there. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Well, you have my email address, so you can always uh, email me. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for coming.